When was the last time you saw blood? Now, I don't mean like when you have a small cut or a small wound and there's a, you know, when I get a little cut, my daughters see the blood and they get concerned, Daddy, you have blood. I don't mean a little bit of blood. I mean lots of blood, like buckets of blood or streams of blood or entire pools of blood. For most of us, the answer to that question would probably be never. I've never seen that much blood, unless you work in a hospital maybe, or you're a butcher. Unlike us, the ancient Hebrews were very familiar with the sight of blood, the smell of blood, with the shedding of blood. As we read our Bibles, as we look at the Old Testament especially, we see blood, blood, blood everywhere. We look, there's blood. And it's no different in the New Testament, the New Covenant. Uh, As one person has put it, the entire story of the Bible is a story that is painted with blood. Some critics have mocked Christianity as being a slaughterhouse religion. And indeed, we recognize this, don't we, when we look at our hymnals and we think about the songs that we sing. Uh, As one pastor said, you know, you you take a Christian hymnal and you find a lot of bloody old hymns. We sing, nothing but the blood. We ask, are you washed in the blood? We say there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Or we sing my favorite, personal favorite, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. And for a person who does not know the language of the Christian faith, they might hear this and wonder, is is this a horror movie? Or is this religion? Well, today we're going to see the necessity of blood. Why blood is so central to our confession. And we're going to see especially how the blood of Christ guarantees our eternal destiny. As we've been going through uh, Hebrews, we have repeatedly said that Hebrews, this letter is originally a sermon. It was a sermon preached by a concerned pastor to a congregation of weary Christians who were tempted to abandon their faith. These were Jewish Christians who were being tempted under persecution to abandon their faith in Christ and to go back to the old covenant system and its sacrifices. And especially in this central section, uh, chapters 7 to 10, the main point that the author wants to get across is that we ought not to go back. You dare not go back because we have a better high priest who offers a better sacrifice, thus gaining entry into a better sanctuary and inaugurating a new and better covenant. Or to put it simply in three words, and you can say these three words with me, Jesus is better. And like a skillful composer and conductor, he has been conducting a symphony. You see these themes emerge as different parts or movements of a symphony. We we saw the high priesthood of Christ and the fact that he's a better priest We've seen that Jesus inaugurates a new and better covenant. We saw last week that he has entered a better sanctuary. And now the author begins to bring together the different themes of the symphony as we enter into kind of a climax. And here this morning, we enter the next movement of the symphony where he shows us that Jesus is our better mediator of a better covenant. Uh, This is a covenant that Jesus inaugurates by his blood that guarantees our salvation. And as we think about that, our hearts should grow in hope. As we look back to what our great and better mediator has done on the cross where he shed his blood, and as we look forward to his promised return to save us forever. So as we look at Chapter 9, verses 15 to 28, we're going to see two aspects of Christ's work 
as our better mediator. Two aspects of Christ's work as our better mediator. First, we will see why our mediator's death was necessary. Why our mediator's death was necessary. That's from verses 15 to 22. And then we'll see why our mediator's ministry is better. That's from verses 23 to 28. So first, why our mediator's death was necessary. Let's read from verse 15. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Therefore, the author says, verse 15, he, that is Christ, is the mediator of a new covenant. Now, this is a very important term as we think about the identity of our Lord Jesus Christ and who he is. What does it mean that he is a mediator? We are familiar with the term mediator in normal everyday life. A mediator is someone who is a go-between. Um, in this country, you might think of your PRO as your mediator. He represents you uh, to the government. Specifically, a mediator comes into play in situations involving conflict. When two parties are in conflict with one another, uh, that's when you seek out or you see a mediator being brought into the scene in order to bring peace, to mediate the conflict and bring peace between these two parties to initiate and bring about reconciliation. That's the kind of mediator that Jesus is. He is one who mediates between God and people. He is fully God and he is fully human just like us. He represents God to us and he acts on our behalf towards the Lord. Specifically, bringing reconciliation, seeking to bring peace. Because you see, all of us are at enmity with God. We'll see more of this in our passage today. We come into this world hostile towards God and he is at enmity towards us because we have sinned against him. We have broken his covenant and transgressed his laws. And so we're all enemies to God, but God has provided Jesus to be our mediator and he functions as mediator in the context of covenant. He acts as a covenant mediator. He represents us in this covenant relationship to the Lord and acts on our behalf before God. Did you see what the author says right as he starts this verse? He says, therefore, he is mediator of a new covenant. So when you look at the word therefore, it means that what he says now comes from what was preceding. Right? So you think about what we looked at the last several weeks. Why do we need Jesus as the mediator of a new covenant? We saw last week that you had this old covenant with its sanctuary where the blood of bulls and goats was uh, spilt, was sacrificed, bulls and goats were sacrificed, uh, and all of this didn't really work to cleanse people's hearts. Uh, these sacrifices of animals only provided an external cleansing. They didn't deal with the heart of the problem, which was the problem of the people's hearts. Right? These sacrifices simply functioned like a credit card that didn't pay off the debt in full, but only stacks up the debt for longer and postpones the payment of debt for the future. Well, all of those sacrifices were not effective. Therefore, he says... Christ has come as the mediator of a new covenant. A new covenant that brings better promises. And, and, and notice what he says. Why is he the mediator of a new covenant? So that, look at verse 15, so that those who are called 
may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Who is it speaking of when it says those who are called? You think about being called by God and immediately the idea of being called by God will take you back to uh, the story of Abraham in Genesis. Abraham was called by God. And of course it follows from that those who are called are not just Abraham and his family and his descendants, but all who share the faith of Abraham, all those who have trusted in God's promises just as Abraham did. What are those promises? What is the promised eternal inheritance? You might remember that God called Abraham, told him to go forth from his home. God made him a set of promises. God promised him that through his family, the entire world would be blessed. All nations would be blessed in him. Uh, God promised him that God was forming a worldwide family of sons and daughters that would know the living God. Not just that, God promised him an inheritance. He promised him land, that there would be a dwelling place for these people. God promised him people and a place. And then as you keep reading the story of the Bible, this promise of an inheritance, of a place, gets expanded. In fact, greatly expanded to the point where it's no longer just a physical piece of real estate in the Middle East. No, no, no. Rather, Abraham and his family are going to inherit the world, the heavenly kingdom of God himself. We see that. We'll see that later when we come to Hebrews chapter 11. It says Abraham was not looking to the land which he came from. No, Abraham was looking forward to the heavenly city coming down whose designer and builder is God. And so the promised eternal inheritance is this, the promise of being sons and daughters of the living God, heirs of eternal life, those who will inherit God's eternal heavenly kingdom forever. And the problem is, the problem is that none of this could be fulfilled, you see, because there was a bigger problem that was blocking the fulfillment of these promises. The author shows us that in verse 15. He is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. A death was necessary in order for us to receive the promised eternal inheritance. And this death was necessary to redeem us from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. What was the problem preventing the fulfillment of God's promises? It was the people's sin. They had transgressed. They had broken their covenant with God. And therefore, the promises could not be fulfilled. Instead, they had a curse hanging over their heads. Verses 16 and 17 explain to us Uh, further the problem that needed to be resolved by by showing us something about how covenants work. Now, if you're reading the ESV and and you look at these verses, you'll see this. You'll see where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. And if you're a careful reader of your Bible, you'll notice that there's a footnote there. And you should always read the footnotes when you're reading your Bible. And the footnote says... In my ESV translation, the footnote says, the Greek word means both covenant and will in verses 16 and 17. So you have a little bit of a a debate here because this word can be translated one of two ways. Uh, The word commonly means covenant. The same Greek word is also used in secular Greek literature to refer to a will, last will and testament, if you know what that is. And many people debate over what specific meaning does it have here in verses 16 and 17. You can see this debate by if you read the old uh, New American Standard Translation, the NASB, if you have that, you would see in the NASB it actually uses the word covenant throughout. It says where a covenant is, the death of the one who made it must be established. Uh, And uh, I have been following this debate for over 10 years now. Uh, I have looked at both sides of it, struggled through it, but I am quite persuaded and convinced that the right way to understand this is to read the word consistently throughout the passage as covenant. 
So I don't think it's accurate to uh, read it as will. I don't think the author is suddenly shifting here from the concept of covenant to the concept of will. I think the best way to understand this is to read it throughout as covenant. In fact, every other instance of the word in Hebrews and in most of the New Testament refers to covenant. All right? And it, it makes a lot of sense because if you're looking at verse 15, he says, this death uh, redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. And you come down again, look at verse 18. It clearly refers to covenant because he says, therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. We've been seeing throughout chapters 7 to 10, the author is speaking again and again of the covenants of God. And so I think that this passage best makes sense when we understand this as covenant. So let me read to you the uh, Aubrey Standard Version and, and translation, which I, think, uh, which I think will give us the correct interpretation of this section. And, and I might say many New Testament scholars take this position. The New American Standard Translation obviously did, but I'll try to make, read it in a, uh, translate it for you in a way that makes it very clear what the meaning is. All right. So follow with me from verse 15 again. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a covenant exists, the death of the covenant maker must be born. For a covenant is confirmed over dead bodies since it is not in force when the covenant maker lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. Now, what in the world does that mean? What does it mean that a covenant is confirmed over dead bodies? And what does it mean that where there is a covenant, the death of the covenant maker must be born? Well, it's quite simple to explain if we think of a covenant and what it is. Right? What is a covenant? I gave you a definition a few weeks ago. A covenant is a committed relationship marked by loyal love and established on binding promises. A covenant is a committed relationship marked by loyal love and established on binding promises. If we were to think of modern ways that we make binding promises and enter into uh, a, a, an agreement or a relationship like this, we would think of the word contract. And, and all of us are familiar with contracts. Now, we don't make a lot of covenants today, but everyone here who has a job has a contract, I hope you do, with your employer. Right? And what does that contract do? It spells out certain responsibilities. It's an agreement. It spells out responsibilities from your side to your employer. It spells out responsibilities from the employer's side to you. And you are both bound to keep those agreements. And oftentimes with most contracts, you will also have penalties spelled out for breaking the contract. If you renege upon the agreement or if you break the contract, then those penalties will be enforced. And of course, you make this agreement by signing. And once you've put your signature there, you're saying, I agree to all the terms and I agree to pay these penalties if I don't keep the terms of this agreement. Covenants function the same way, except instead of signing, they would perform this ritual where they cut up animals and then you walk in the midst of animals agreeing that the penalty, should you break the covenant, is that you will be made like those animals. In other words, you would die for breaking the covenant. And in all covenants, especially with a holy God, the penalty for breaking the covenant is death. Is death. We sometimes make promises like this, right? I mean, you shouldn't really, as a Christian, we ought not to make promises like this. But when we we're kids, you know, sometimes people will say, uh, you know, do you promise? And they'll say, yes, I promise. Do you really promise? And then people will say, I swear to God, never do that. But usually that means, okay, may God strike me if I break my promise. Or if you're familiar with uh, American parlance, sometimes people will say, I cross my heart and hope to die. In other words, you're saying, if I break this promise, may God kill me. That's what they were saying with covenants. And you see an example of that covenant-making ceremony actually in the Bible. If you're reading the book of Genesis, you read Genesis 15. And what happens in Genesis 15? God has made promises to this man named Abram, whom he has called. And Abram wants to be sure of God's promises. Lord, how will I know for sure? 
And the Lord says he's going to enter into covenant with Abram. So he tells Abram to bring sacrificial animals. You can read this chapter when you go home, Genesis 15. Abraham cuts up the sacrificial animals and places them on the ground. The Lord puts Abram into a deep sleep. And then as Abram is sleeping, something strange happens. He sees a smoking pot and a flaming torch passing in the midst of the pieces. What is that? Well, the smoke and the fire represent the presence of Almighty God Himself. God is passing between the pieces of these sacrificial animals. He is making a covenant with Abram. And something very unusual here, you see, when in all covenant-making rituals, both parties will pass between the pieces of the animals, saying, if I break my part of the covenant, may what has happened to these animals fall upon me. May the curse of the covenant fall on me. Here, Abram is not walking in the midst of the pieces. He's passive. Only the Lord walks between the pieces of the slain animals. As if to say, if I break my promises to you, Abraham, or if you and your descendants break this covenant, may the curse, may the penalty for it fall upon me. God guarantees both sides of the covenant. And then you enter into this tension in the biblical story. How is this going to take place? Because you read a few chapters and you already see Abraham fails in many ways. Abraham has then many descendants, the people of Israel, there in slavery in Egypt. The covenant keeping God rescues them from slavery in Egypt, brings them to himself, and enters into another covenant, this time with the whole nation. And this covenant now is going to be the way that God fulfills the promises that he made in the covenant with Abraham. This covenant is kind of like a secondary contract that adds to what came in the previous contract. And the people of Israel agree to the covenant. You, the text that we read earlier today, Exodus chapters 19 to 24, lay out that covenant-making ceremony. And they say, everything that God commands, we will do. We will obey the covenant. But even before the covenant is made, what do they do? They go and build a golden calf. And so upon this people hangs the sentence of death. God's promises cannot be fulfilled because the people deserve to die. Because the people deserve the curse of the covenant. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 28 makes note of that. That under the law of Moses, every transgression, people were killed without mercy upon, with two or three witnesses. God's promises could not be fulfilled because there was a debt that needed to be paid. And all of the blood of bulls and goats could never pay that debt, dear friends. You, you know, you, you think of a common issue in this country. It happens here often, and it's very sad. Uh, sometimes uh, people are living here, and they get themselves into some kind of trouble. Uh, maybe this is you. If it's you, we would love to talk to you and find ways that we can support you and help you. But people stack up a lot of debt or they get into trouble with the law by overstaying visa, and then the, the amounts begin to pile up, and you soon find yourself with this insurmountable mountain of debt, and there's no way out. And then sometimes the person even finds like an opportunity to start afresh. They, they may find a job in another country, or uh, another way to go back home and start anew. But you see, the problem is you can't leave you can't start, have a fresh start because all of this debt still remains that needs to be paid. It was the same for these people. They could not experience or could not receive the promises of God of an eternal inheritance. Those promises of blessing could not be fulfilled because they had all of the debt of their sin. They had all of the curses of the covenant standing over their heads. And that's why, the author says, there was blood. Therefore, verse 18, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. 
This is why everywhere you look in that covenant, in the Old Testament, you see blood. This is why animals were sacrificed. This is why blood was used to purify the sanctuary, to remind them constantly that the wages of sin is death. Remember I told you last week, when we talk about the blood of Christ, when we talk about blood, it, it's not referring to blood as some kind of a magical substance that has some protective power. It's, it's not talking about, you know, you, you can recite this like a mantra and say like, you know, uh, the, the, the blood of Christ protect me or I put the blood of Christ on the car or on the house. No, when it's speaking of the blood of Jesus in the New Testament, in the Bible, when it speaks of blood, it's speaking of death. And that's very clear in this passage. You see, verse uh, 15 says, A death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions. And you come down again to verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The, the term used there for shedding of blood is a very violent term. It's talking about spilling blood in such a way that a person dies. The penalty for breaking the covenant was death. And then again and again, the sacrificial system the, the constant presence of blood among the people reminds the people the wages of sin is death. It teaches the people the wages of sin is death. It smears it on their minds and puts it in their hearts. The wages of your sin is death. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. What could be the solution to this? How could this debt be erased and paid off so that they could be guaranteed the fulfillment of God's promises? There had to be a better sacrifice. And the answer is that sacrifice has been made, dear friends. Look at verse 23. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. That old sanctuary, that entire old covenant system, all of those sacrifices were just a copy, a preview like a drama, a ritual that didn't bring final forgiveness, but that kept reminding the people you still have a debt that needs to be paid. The wages of your sin is death. And there will be a better sacrifice that comes. And when that better sacrifice comes, we will have access into the presence of God. That better sacrifice has come. Jesus has died. His death has been carried out. Not in an earthly tabernacle, his blood is not like the blood of animals, but his death, the shedding of his blood, his better sacrifice, pays the penalty for sin once for all. His death redeems sinners from their transgressions. His death avails in the heavenly presence of God himself. Do you see why it was necessary for the Son of God to die? You know, sometimes you might have conversations with your Muslim friends. I often have some of these conversations. And, and it's a common question that will come up. Why, why was it necessary? If you're saying Jesus was God, if you say that Jesus is the Son of God, why did Jesus have to die? Why this one person standing in the place of another? Why does he have to die such a shameful death? And then you say, well, he had to die because of sin. And it's hard for a Muslim friend to understand because they will say, well, sin, is it really such a big deal? It's, it's mistakes that we make. And, and here we say, no, no, no. Sins are not just mistakes that you and I make. It's not a casual thing or a light thing. No, sin is when you break covenant, when you renege on the contract with the holy God and creator of the universe himself. We have violated the contractual agreement with our creator. And therefore our sins are a very serious thing. And the penalty for those sins is a curse. And death and condemnation. But then the son of God comes forward. As one who is fully God. And therefore fully able to bear. The penalty for our sins. He is fully man. Like us. Like you and me in every way. Yet without sin himself. I can't stand as a representative for you. I'm a sinner. We can't stand as representatives and substitutes for each other. Because we're all sinners. But Jesus is fully human and yet without sin. Perfect. Spotless. And he acts as our representative in the covenant. He acts as our substitute. His death is born as a substitute. For covenant breakers to pay the penalty for all sin committed under the old covenant and to inaugurate the new covenant to give us forgiveness of sins 
and a fresh start. Have you ever wondered how Old Testament believers had their sins forgiven? Uh, People in the Old Testament, people who trusted in God, like David, but sinned, were great sinners. How, How were their sins forgiven? We've noted again and again, the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. So how were their sins forgiven? Well, like I said, those sacrifices work like a credit card. It kind of makes a provisional payment, but the debt keeps mounting. Their sins were forgiven at the cross. All of the transgressions that were committed by the old covenant believers, by the Old Testament saints, were laid upon our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. He bore the curse of the covenant in his death for their sins. And so all of their debt was washed clean, wiped clean. Their sins were washed away by his death on the cross. Jesus' death works backwards for all who came before him, trusting in the promises of God. That's what this text is saying. His death redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. How about us? How can we have our sins forgiven? You see, we're all sinners, you and I. All of us are covenant breakers. Starting with our first father, Adam, who in the garden transgressed his covenant with God, broke God's commands, brought upon himself and the entire human race the guilt and penalty of that first sin. All of us come into this world by nature and by choice, hostile to God, alienated from him, his enemies. All of us violate his commands. All of us deserve death. We have no basis for being in a covenant relationship with the Holy, with the Holy God. The sentence upon us is one of condemnation. How can our transgressions be forgiven? How can your sins be forgiven? And the answer is, at the cross. Because before Jesus goes to the cross, in his last meal with his disciples, lifting up the cup, he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And then as he hung on the cross, shed his blood, took upon himself the curse of the wrath of God for sinners. His death inaugurated a new and better covenant, providing the forgiveness of sins and guaranteeing the fulfillment of God's promises, the promised blessings of God to all who belong to this new covenant. If you are a part of the new covenant people, our sins are forgiven. And not only are our sins forgiven, but our eternal destiny is guaranteed and secured. We have a promised eternal inheritance that nothing or no one can take away. The promises of God are made sure. And you hear that and we say, what a great love this is. Oh, what an amazing love that every single one of us broke covenant with God. Every single one of us has rebelled against him. Every single one of us deserves the penalty of death for our sins. But God in his great love and mercy sent us his own son, our Lord Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, who died a death not for his own sins, but for us, that we might be forgiven. And maybe you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and you're still in your sins and the penalty of death hangs over you. I want to call you to turn from your sins and come to this gracious God. Come to Jesus and receive Him as your representative before God. Receive Him as your substitute. Receive Him as your mediator so that you might be forgiven of sins and have eternal life. And that's why Jesus' death was necessary, do you see? As the mediator of the new covenant, his death pays the penalty for the transgressions, the sins of covenant breakers like you and me, and guarantees the fulfillment of God's promises to all God's people. That's the first aspect of our mediator's work. We saw why our mediator's death was necessary. 
Next we see why our mediator's ministry is better. Why our mediator's ministry is better. And as I read through verses 23 to 28, I want you to notice uh, the three different time settings. Three different time settings in which Christ's work operates. All right? And I also want you to notice the word appear. Okay? The word appear. Let's look at verses 23 and following. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So as we see why Jesus' ministry is better, as a better mediator of the new covenant, I want us to look at three appearances of his work in this passage. First, he appears now in heaven as our intercessor. He appears now in heaven as our intercessor. Then we'll see that he appeared once for all as our sin bearer. And then we'll see that he points us to his second coming. He will appear in the future as our deliverer. He appears first. He appears now in heaven as our intercessor. Verses 23 and 24. Look at 24. Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God, on our behalf. See, this old covenant high priest who offered sacrifices under the old system, those were just a shadow. Those were just a preview. Those were just like the pictures of food that you see on the menu, not the real meal itself. That was all a temporary system that was pointing forward, a pattern that was intending to teach us. But Christ has now come. And he has offered a final sacrifice. Not only has he offered a final sacrifice, but he rose from the dead, defeating death, ascended into heaven. And he appears now in the presence of God, in the heavenly places, on our behalf. Did you see that? For you and for me. And what that means, dear friend, is this. That from now to the very end of your life, till you breathe your final breath, your Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, appears before the face of the Father in heaven, praying for you. He prays for us all the time. And the Father will not leave his prayers for you and me unanswered. No matter what you're going through, he guarantees the forgiveness of our sins. Not only does he guarantee the forgiveness of our sins, even as we all fall short every day, but he guarantees that you will make it to the end. That no matter what trials come our way, no matter what difficulties we face, you will make it to the end, dear brother or sister. Because Jesus is praying for you and his praise, prayers do not cease. He appears on our behalf, guaranteeing that one day we will be with him. I don't know what you're going through, but I do know this. Whether you're facing struggles at work, whether you're facing rejection and hostility from dear friends or even family because of your faith in Christ, Maybe you are being tempted with some particular sins and you're struggling in the midst of those temptations. Even for people like this, like Jeremy and his dear church who have lost everything in the, in the midst of their darkness, he appears before the presence of God on 
our behalf, praying for us, for Sabas, for Pius, for Lynn, for Judith, by name, day and night. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, my faith is weak. I'm wavering. I, I, I don't have faith. I don't even know if my faith will last for one more day. And let me assure you that the promises of God do not depend on the strength of your faith, but on the power of our Savior, who prays for you day and night. He guarantees you will make it to the end. He appears now in heaven as our intercessor. He appeared, second, he appeared once for all as our sin bearer. Did you see verses 25, 26? Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly. But as it is, verse 26, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. When Jesus rose from the dead and entered into heaven, he didn't go there to offer himself repeatedly. He's not being sacrificed again and again for the forgiveness of our sins. The work is done. Kalas, he did it once for all. You know, the old system, the high priest would offer the same sacrifices again and again, the blood of the bull, the blood of the goat, go and rinse, repeat, year after year. Go into the holy places, indicate that a death has occurred. Not so with Jesus. The author said if Jesus had to die again and again for sins, then he would have had to die from before the foundation of the world. He would be constantly suffering all the time for sins. And that's bizarre. No, he does not. He did it once for all. It's finished. It's done. He appeared once for all. Well, look at when he appeared. He appeared at the end of the ages. The, the New Testament uses this expression again and again. At, at the fullness of time, the Son of God came. And you might ask the question, what was the most pivotal moment in history, in the history of this world? You know, maybe if you were to say the most pivotal moment in world history, you can ask someone this question and it'll tell you a lot about what they believe, how they answer that question. Someone says the most pivotal moment in history was when Gutenberg invented the printing press. You know, well, that person values learning and education. For the Christian, the most pivotal moment in history is when Jesus died on the cross and cried out, it is finished. It divides all of history into two, right? We acknowledge that when we write the date and say 2022. And what did Jesus accomplish in that moment? He put away sin. He put away sin once for all. Like, you know, some, some of you live in apartments. I live in an apartment. We take out the trash, you take it, and then you put it into that garbage chute, right? It's gone. You never see it again. Out of sight, out of mind, forever. That's what Jesus did with sin. It's done, once for all. And the author reminds us again by an, an analogy here in, in verse 27 and 28. Do you see what he says? He says, just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, his point there simply is this, we only die once, all human beings only live and die once, right? You don't die multiple times. Uh, the so-called worldviews and religions which say that you're reincarnated and you die again and again, th th these are false. It's just common knowledge, it's clear that all of us live once, we die once, that's it. After that comes judgment. In the same way, Christ only needed to die once. He died once, he was offered once to bear the sins of many. And you have there the very crucial biblical doctrine that all of us should know, the doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement. In other words, Jesus died a death that accomplished penal substitutionary atonement. What does that mean? His death is penal, bearing the punishment for sinners, taking upon himself the penalty for sin. His death is substitutionary. He acts as a substitute. He didn't die for his own sins. No, the text tells us he was offered once to bear the sins of many. He's a substitute. Bearing the wrath of God for all those who trust him. And notice it says he was offered once to bear the sins of many. Jesus offered himself. 
But God put him forward as an offering. This was God's plan. The cross was God's plan. Designed by God for our salvation. That the Lord put forward Jesus as our perfect substitute. To bear the wrath of God and propitiate, turn away God's wrath from sinners. Jesus, the Son of God, offered himself freely, willingly, as a substitute for his people. The Holy Spirit applies the finished work of Christ to our hearts when we repent and believe, therefore guaranteeing the forgiveness of our sins and promising eternal life. He was offered once to bear the sins of many. In other words, the account has been settled. For you and for me who trust in Christ, the debt has been paid. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part but in whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. He appears now as our intercessor. He appeared once for all as our sin bearer. And finally, his ministry is better because he will appear in the future as our deliverer. Verse 28, Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The cross is the turning point and the hinge of world history, but it's not the end of world history. No, the end of history will be when this same Jesus who was crucified and rose from the dead, will come back. Dear brother or sister, he's coming back. He's coming back. Are you waiting? He's coming back for those who are eagerly waiting for him. He, he will appear again a second time. Life is hard. Believe me, I know it's hard. This life is hard. The road is long. There are many trials along the way. There are so many temptations to give up. But Jesus will come back. And he will wipe every tear from our eyes. And he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And He will welcome us into our eternal home with him. He has promised to return. He will appear for you. And this knowledge that he's coming is sufficient to support our souls in all difficulties, all trials, all distresses. Are you waiting for him? I want to speak one more time to those who are here who are not waiting for him. If you're here and you don't know this Christ, if you haven't banked all your hope on him, If that's you, I want to call your attention, dear friend, to verse 27, which says, It is appointed for man to die once, and after this comes judgment. Many years ago in Kentucky, I used to go with my friends on Fridays and Saturdays uh, to evangelize people uh, downtown. So we would go uh, kind of a street corner, busy street corner downtown, and begin conversations with people. I'd want to talk to them about Christ. And one of the questions I used to always ask, hey, can I talk to you for a few minutes? Uh, Do do you know what happens when you die? And one time I remember this 15-year-old boy, he looked me straight in the eye when I asked him this, you know what happens when we die? And his answer was, yeah, we all become manure for trees. I want you to know that we do not become manure for trees. Hear the words of Scripture which says, It is appointed for a man to die once and after this comes judgment. We will stand before our creator and our judge. And this is the reason why we fear death. This is why we try to push death away from our minds. The fact that we will all have to give an answer for the lives that we have lived. We will face judgment. Dear friend, I want you to know that you can have no fear of that judgment if you trust in Jesus. If you repent of your sin and put your faith in this great Savior, no fear of death, no fear of judgment, but the promise of a heavenly, eternal inheritance. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have so great a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we put all our hope in him as we eagerly await his coming. In Jesus' name, amen.